Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. My name is Margaret Pinard. I'm a historical fiction and fantasy writer. I am without my tea this morning, but that's okay. I've got plenty of books and they took up all the space and I didn't want to risk spilling the tea on the books. So there we are. Lots and lots of books. I raided the bookshelves all over the apartment to bring you, that's right, the purpose of this video this Sunday is to bring you all the book recommendations you might possibly want for November. I love reading for readathons, and there are three I'm aiming for in November. They are Nonfiction November from Olive at a Book Olive, Historathon, which has a bunch of co-hosts, but I see most videos by Revenant Reads, and Indigathon or Native November or Skoden or whatever it's going to be where we read books by Indigenous folks, fiction and nonfiction. So the first two are what I'm going to cover today. And um, yeah, so it's going to be a lot of nonfiction. Hold on to your hats. And I will say I read a lot of nonfiction. There's a lot that does not make this list, but I went through my story graph and looked at all the nonfiction books and the cutoff was like 4.25 and above stars. So these are really good in all different sorts of ways, mostly history and sociology and um, some science and nature worked in at the end. And mostly US centric, but also some UK because we are Anglophiles here on the channel. So yes, that's what we will be touching on today. And what else did I need to relate? So I'll go into a few details of the um, readathons, but not super uh, comprehensive because those people who are running them have great announcement videos. So I'll just drop those in. We've got a book olive and Revenant Reads. So I'll pop those in the chat so people can check them out and maybe plan to read a book or two with me in November. That would be fun. Um, and I keep wanting to reach into the subject matter that I haven't read, but I'm saving that, right? We're going to separate favorites to recommend and books to be read that I don't know. They sound good, but who knows, right? So we're going to wait until November 1st. That is when I will drop my TBR for all three readathons. And it will be, it will have some fiction in there as well as nonfiction. That is why this list is so long. I'm not going to be reading it. It's all the favorites from like the last, I don't know, two-ish years, three-ish years, plus a few really long ago ones. You'll see. You'll see. Um, so, now that I have those details out of the way, I can reward myself and say hello to the chat. R.C. Scott was here early. Barrett Laurie was here early, reminding people about that like button. Thank you, Barrett. I think it was mainly because of my karaoke session with Barrett yesterday, the evening, author tubers host karaoke every second Saturday, that I woke up in such a good mood. I mean, it could be that I woke up and read for two hours, and finished a book or it could be that like the singing the endorphins and the fog that was drifting in across the city it was just gorgeous so bear pointed out to me that i didn't know before that yesterday i hit 900 subscribers which is awesome i that was a bit of a jump of like four or five at once and so i did not see that until he pointed it out which was lovely Anita is here, AF Stewart, saying hello, hello. People are saying hello, hello. I wanted to point people, if you're on BookTok, and Anita is now on BookTok, and so you should go follow her there because she's awesome. Elena Abravanel, good morning, good morning. Lovely to see you here. And Jim is here as well, another friendly booktuber. <laughs> Still here. Last night's always fun reading out. <laughs> Leslie is here, another friendly booktuber. Late. Happy Sunday, everyone. I think I went um, live a minute or so early because there are people waiting and what am I, what am I going to do? I have formatting to do. I have done some work this morning. I will go back to that after, but this is my little fun piece of Sunday. And she punched the like button. I think, I think Andy's aggressiveness with the like button is rubbing off on Leslie 
Emma Bennett here saying congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And again, no tea, just books today. So with that, let's get started. Um, I've got a question. I've got a question today, which is like one of my goals has been to try to get recommendations out in time for people to like take them into consideration when planning for books. So I've had this for a few weeks and I decided October 15th, you got two weeks, should be enough time to sort of like think about it, maybe check it out from the library and then put it on your TBR for November. But I don't know, I could be totally off. So when do you plan, if you plan and you're not 100% mood reader, what you'll read? Is, is that a good time frame? Let me know. I'll leave that up for folks as they come in and settle in to the back. Um, uh, ooh, Anita's got some TikTok videos planned for Nano. Fun. I wonder if any of them have anything to do with the Fairy Tales and Nightmares trailer. That would be fun. No tea. WTF. I know. I There's lots of books, Emma. I have to, I have to be careful here. <laughs> Created by Susan Montgomery. Hey, everyone. Hey, hey, hey. So we've got a question and we're going to dive in to the first tranche of recommendations for Nonfiction November that also satisfy Historathon. So Nonfiction November, run by Olive, usually takes a few keywords. She chooses four and basically read a book, read a nonfiction book, or be really fancy and try to find books that fit these words somehow. It can be obvious. It can be crafty. It can be sly, whatever you like, right? So this year, her words are, oh, and I've got a book for one of them. Ta-da! Fraud. Gosh, I wonder why she thought of that this year. So fraud, display, capital, with an AL and web. Interesting. They, they all seem to cluster one direction for me. And of course, this is like an interpretive exercise. So your mileage may vary. But we're going to dive into US centric books that I have read and really gotten a lot out of, especially for the fraud theme word and maybe capital. So I have some overlays and I have some physical books. So we will be jumping back and forth. I hope everyone has their seatbelts on and their hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle. The first recommendation. This was my five-star read at the beginning of last year, I believe, How the Word is Passed by Clint Smith. This I read on audio, which is why I have this. I didn't make them square. Apologies to everyone. I was really hurrying this morning. Um from Libro.fm. So how the word is passed is basically like a historical detective. Clint Smith is a poet. Uh, and in this book, it's more of a memoir because he's interrogating history, both like for his own peace of mind, as well as his, um, his, his work with academics and, um, black history and wrestling with the legacy of slavery and how it all still affects us. So he goes to different sites in America, across the sea, in Africa, and does some really fascinating interviews with people who are in really interesting positions. The one that pops to my head is a tour guide at Monticello and then observing like the tourists who come and someone who worked at like the gift shop ticket office at a Confederate cemetery in Virginia. It's close by, a few hours. Um, and, and then also the place that is described as being one of the sailing off points for slave ships on the coast of West Africa and the door of no return and sort of the myths and things that have um, sprung up around one of those places as well as the history that they can determine. Really, really fascinating. Um, the subtitle is A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America. So he's great in his poetry and he's great in his historical nonfiction. So that is number one. Uh, let's see. We've got The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. This is one I bought and that is like all the places where I was interrogating my reading. I'm a very active reader. Even if you don't see a lot of page flags, I, I had 
I had the book. I owned it, so I didn't feel bad turning down the pages. A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. And there have been several books that I've read that um, overlap in this topic. Basically, it's a history of policy, U.S. policy, and I don't want to spoil the book that I'm going to be highlighting last. But basically, um, when slavery ended and emancipation or abolition came into play, um, people in power managed to uh, keep that power in certain ways through laws. And basically that's this, um, especially in um, redlining is like the most famous example, which is why they have that picture of the neighborhoods. So if you can't get loans for a house, you can't live in certain neighborhoods, you won't have access to certain schools. It's like a trickle down effect in the real way that actually works um, of how people in power maintained the um, tools of power and oppression even after 15th, 14th, 15th, 13th, 14th, 15th amendments um, went into play. So that was really revealing. Um, it's, I think, a political scientist. So he brings lots of studies and facts and figures, which is not really my favorite. Um, there's a couple other books, like I said, that touch on this topic in different ways, but this is the one that I chose to feature and recommend for nonfiction November. I don't know where I'm going to put all these books after I finish with them. Um, that is book two. Book three is, it should be, <laughs> I uploaded all these. Nope, it's not there. Shoot. Okay, we will not have a, phys a visual for book three. It's Milltown. And this is a memoir slash history about a town in Maine that this woman grew up in. She's a journalist. And she talks about growing up there and the environmental catastrophe that is the legacy of the mills, the lumber mills, the paper mills, because lumber you might think well you're cutting up trees how does that destroy the environment well then you have paper mills and there's a lot of things that go into modern paper um, including chemicals that they put in to separate things and chemicals that they put in to make the paper and byproducts of that whole process and where does it go into the waterways so not only was there this environmental catastrophe kind of angle to it but it was also interesting to hear her talk about her family history there. She has a French last name and because I don't have it up and I'm not going to look for it. I don't have it at the tip of my tongue. Um, but she talked about some of her family being outsiders because they were French Canadians and they came down and emigrated to the US and like the different pieces of community. So I've had books where I've had to study and research a little bit of that, but not to the degree that she had with her family. So she's got health stuff with her family and like grief stuff. She's got um, historical culture. She's got environmental disaster. It's a lot in a book, which is why Milltown just sort of encompasses like all these things happening in her lifetime and before um, in this one place. So I thought that was really interesting, especially for anyone who lives in Maine or in other communities that have been around the lumber, timber industries. Um, and think about that sort of stuff. What cancer? That doesn't exist. There's no link. What are you talking about? Oh, and like strikes. So it also had like labor movement stuff. It was just really interesting. So that's book three. All right, let's see if we have some answers to the question. Jim says, I usually plan my TBR in the last week of the month. Score! I made it in case any of these like cut ice with you or whatever the expression is. <laughs> Leslie says, hey, I have the color of law on my shelf. Nice. That means you probably, it, it indicates to me you have it on your shelf, but you haven't read it. I'd recommend a good one. Susan Montgomery, I don't really plan my TBR. I just read as things come my way. I use Hoopla a lot. Ah, okay. So Hoopla, you don't have control over when it drops in and you sort of need to take advantage of the moment when the library has availability. That totally makes sense. Yay. I'm Victoria Talks. Writing is here. Hello, hello, friend. Welcome. 
we've got question of the day and I am plowing through a long list of recommendations for nonfiction November and Historathon. Oh, and this is a good time to relate the Historathon details. So Historathon is actually a year-long readathon, but um, it's all of history and it divided it up into three month chunks by era. <laughs> Excuse me. So the first three quarters of the year were eras that I'm not interested in. It was like prehistory and Greek and Roman. We don't we don't stand the Roman Empire here and uh, medieval and Renaissance. And sure, that's great if you like those things. But I am a Victorian girl. So 1820 to the present is the current quarter of the year, October, November, December. So that's why I'm recommending these books for anyone who is participating in Historathon. You're in my era now. So <laughs> that's the Historathon details. And we will pass on to book number four here. Um, and then I'll get back to our question of the day. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so book number four is I, re I read and is very similar to, I read around the same time as, and is very similar to Milltown in that um, Oak Flat, A Fight for Sacred Land in the American West by Lauren Redness. I love it when I can read the author right off the screen. Um, is also a, a book about an environmental catastrophe that also encompasses family, grief, cultural knowledge, um, and history and all different sorts of its facets, which I love. This is the book I kind of love to sink my teeth into. So Oak Flat is um, not in Portland, Maine. It's in, I think, Arizona and like a corner of Arizona or New Mexico that um, currently I think has an observatory on it. It's one of these places that's very hot, very dry, but it has a mountain that was thought to be a great spot for dark sky, meaning good to observe the stars and use some expensive instruments to um calculate scientific things about the stars um, because this mountain is in the middle of a very flat place and that means I don't know not a lot of light pollution anyway the way that this came about was not without struggle because while these scientific gurus thought this is the perfect place for us to set up all of our equipment the people who had lived there for thousands of years the indigenous folks the native tribes who had held that mountain sacred we're like, oh, no, that's that's not okay. That's our mountain. That's where we go for rituals. That's where we have um, adolescent uh, coming of age rituals and all these other sorts of important things. And they fought and they fought and they fought. And I think they built it. And I don't know where it has uh, ended up at this point. But the stuff is there, just like on Hawaii. So the environmental catastrophe part in this part of the world, in the Southwest, was about the mining that was originally in the area, um, originally meaning like 18th century, 19th century. Silver, tin, copper, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing besides the scientific observatory on top of the mountain is that there are underground rights that are negotiated and bought and um, that is often behind closed doors. So that is another way that like patrimony and wealth of the land is being stolen because people want to do a more high tech modern way of flushing out some of the um, um, uh, whatever metals, expensive metals that are used in the electronics industry now. So there's that whole thing that they're fighting against. And I don't know where they are in that battle either because this is from a couple years ago and, you know, the fight is hard to follow because there are so many different fights. But it was a fascinating look at the people who are trying to reclaim the mountain and the cultural patrimony of the region. Um, and where they are with the drought, with the Colorado Mountain, Colorado River Pact now, like that would be really interesting to get an update on. So... Nonfiction November. It's all yours. This book number four. Book number five, we've got the library book by Susan Orlean. And I think you might be figuring out that I have a taste for eclectic, not only 
eclectic books entirely, but books that are eclectic in themselves, meaning that the authors like to take one issue and see it from all sides or take one place and see a bunch of different issues that have evolved in that place, etc. So the library book is not really about a library or libraries. Susan Orlean, I think, is pretty famous for doing this. This is the only book of hers that I've read, but I've been told it's just sort of her style. She's also the author of The Orchid Thief, which is a fairly famous book as well. And um, basically, she's looking into a certain fire in a library in Southern California um, recently, 20, 30 years ago. I think it was in the late 80s. So in our lifetimes, in my lifetime anyway, and um, she talks about the importance of the library to the community, how it started, the people who were important to its founding, which is sort of odd because she's also investigating like who started the fire? Was it arson? Did they catch the person? There was this one suspect who was really looking like it could have been him, but nothing got ever got pinned to him. And like, is it a true crime? No, it, it's kind of arguing with itself as to what genre it belongs in, which was a little confusing to read. But the individual pieces were really interesting. Um, she talks about libraries in general. She talks about California's development um, and some other stuff. And I, I don't remember because, again, that's like two years ago. So I remember it being really fascinating and eclectic. So if you're looking for something that's a bit of a grab bag with a really interesting journalistic writing style, Susan Early in the library book might fit the bill for your nonfiction November and historiathon. Um, so that's five, one, two, three, four, five, one more, six. Labor and Capital in the Gilded Age, edited by John Garrity. So this is straight up a research book. I don't know if you're going to be able to find this. Um, maybe, you know, like in electronic digital editions on, um, uh, what is that site that has all the books to lend out, um, for like hours at a time? can't remember. But this was a really interesting book when I was researching the Gilded Age in Chicago. <coughs> it's actual testimony of people in Congress and people they interviewed. So like if you get called to, not subpoena, but um, uh, called to testify to Congress about what was your working situation? How many hours did you work? What breaks did you get? What did the foreman say to you? And like that kind of stuff. So really interesting because right now what we're seeing through social media is all about people going on strike and what they're striking for whether it's writers or auto workers and like it all seems very reasonable right and it's just that these billionaires this like handful of people in each of these industries doesn't want to let go of the power so um they don't want to be seen as weak maybe because they think if they concede a little bit like their empire falls which maybe fair um but also like not a good reason not to give people a living wage um so yeah so it's all happened before and it makes very entertaining reading <laughs> because it's at a distance which is why i love reading about history and incorporating it incorporating it into my fiction so again hard to find but if you can see it on line or you know get it from the library i definitely recommend um, there's the information if you can see it and I don't know where I got this BA 350. I don't remember anymore. I don't have a tag or sticker on it. So <laughs> I don't know where you might find another copy, but that is six. So now I get another break to see in the chat how we're doing. <laughs> um, Oh gosh. Okay. I see some funny comments. So Victoria came in to say hello. Maggie came in to say hello. Victoria's got an answer, which is I pick a few challenges on StoryGraph and make some vague genre goals. I like it. I like it. Usually readathons will evolve. Evolve? Evolve around? What's the word I'm looking for? Oh gosh. Okay. My brain um revolve around genres so that's pretty good strategy <laughs> excuse me um yeah and storygraph is a good place to find them i have gone on storygraph and not found <laughs> excuse me what's the price i pay for having a life partner with fur 
Um, and not found really big readathons. So I think some people skip over that, but it is a good place to find like smaller ones too. Aggie says, my TBR is more for a purpose. Like I have spent the last two months reading newsletter freebies and author hooks uh, because I'm thinking of starting a newsletter. So yeah, research. So just like my research and history for writing, yours is research into marketing for your books. That's great. Ooh, okay. So I think Maggie is telling us that Oak Flat is near Phoenix in Arizona. Thank you. Considered sacred because of the pinnacle rock formations and the walking prayer ritual. Yeah, they did sort of walk the line between telling us about what the tribes that were nearby used the area for while also like keeping part of it private because it was personal experience. So I liked how they, they treated that in the book. Victoria says, not be going to add this to my TBR just to see that it's already on there. <laughs> is that Oak Flat? That would be, that would be a good one. The case is still in the Ninth Circuit's Court of Appeals and supports the Apache Nation's right to the land back. Oh, Maggie's got the, the, the deets. So thank you, Maggie, for the update. Yeah, the Apache Nation. Oh, good. Oh, boy. I hope they, I hope they get it. Barrett Laurie says, speak for yourself, Margaret. I'm far too young to remember the 19 aughts, he says. <laughs> is that a, a typo? A Freudian slip? Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jim. Jim remembered. The Internet Archive lends out books an hour at a time. Thank you. So I think it's internetarchive.org, and that might be where you would find something tricky like this if you're interested in, like, the the details. Um, let's see. 1980s. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Testify. <laughs> Shane has stopped in to say hello. What is up with YouTube? I didn't get the notification again. Made friends with the like button. Thank you, Shannon. Rachel says, I didn't see you were on. Andy had to tell me. Oh, good. I'm glad Andy is spreading the gospel while he's on at the same time. Justiva is on and wave. Hello. Hello. We've got some hellos. Yes. Andy told me too. The stream wasn't even showing on my homepage. Doesn't YouTube know that Margaret is my buddy? Sheesh. Yeah. I don't know. I, I was talking about this with Barrett, actually. Um, I scheduled the stream and I keep it unlisted because I do it a little further out because I'm sharing space and I want someone to know that I'm blocking out the time on my StreamYard account. But then a few days before is when I um, make it public. So maybe it doesn't even pop up in your stream so the notifications don't know to go on. Who knows? Who knows? Um, Susan Montgomery. I read quite a few memoirs. Oh, I read quite a few memoirs the last couple of months as I have been writing mine. Oh, okay. I think it's finally done and planning on a February, March release. A forward writer is working on her part. Oh, exciting. That's very cool. Um, I read memoirs, but not usually straight memoirs. Like just this is what happened in my life. Usually it's like nature memoirs or uh, exploring a place like Milltown. So I wonder what yours will be like. Feel free to let us know in the comments. Eva says, I'm far too old to remember the 1980s. <laughs> I don't feel old, but I remember the 80s too. Yeah, my notification is 27 minutes old. And it's 27 minutes after the hour. I think I started a, a minute early. It's a mystery. Okay, so let's get back to book number seven I think we're on, which is an overlay. So this is a very short book, but I thought very interesting stuff that I did not know before. So Ida B. The Queen. Have you guys heard of Ida B. Wells? She's not someone I knew about growing up. And I had heard the name just in the last, I don't know, 10 years as an adult, as someone who was on the scene as a suffragist and a civil rights activist early in the century before like the 60s civil rights activism. Um this is a short book by Michelle Duster, who is a descendant of Ida B. Wells. Uh, and it's about her life and legacy, as it says. This I listened to as an audio as well. And what stands out to me in my memory about this, why I recommend it, is that it had a really uh, great style of talking about Chicago and the relationships between people in the North and the South in this sort of crucial in between time about 1900 so like after the civil war and reconstruction all that stuff that went on and was a struggle and before 
uh, the 1960s, 1950s civil rights activism. You have this whole, um, I think, period where it was, how would I, how would I describe this in like a graph? Um, Jim Crow was in place and you also had, uh, things put in place, um, for example, like segregation in the North. So you had crappy racist stuff happening all over, but learning about the things that Ida B. Wells worked for in a newspaper office at the World Fair, like for stuff that I'm studying that is itself sort of segregated information was really interesting. I remember one of the early things she did was get on a train and sit in a car that had no one in it, but was like a white car going to the north or going to the south and being asked and like having a little like sit in in like 1890s. I think it was I think it was one of the earlier things. So lots of cool things that you don't usually hear and a short listen if you're on Libro.fm. So great book, Ida Be the Queen by Michelle Duster. Number seven, number eight. We've got another paper one that might be hard to find. The Populist Moment by Lawrence Goodwin. A short history of the agrarian revolt in America. And I know, I know you're asking, where are my nerd glasses? I must have set them down somewhere. And you're right. This was a research book. Again, straight out of the Chicago book. I was researching 1893. I was trying to look for like the edge of the reconstruction sort of back backflow, no, not backflow, backlash. There we go. Backlash um, to see what it would have been like in a poor neighborhood in Chicago. What were the political stances? What were the tensions? If people were standing in a crowd, what would have set them off? This, These sorts of things. So we're here and I'm trying to learn about populism because I know it develops into a political movement and it's sort of a flash in the pan, but like, where does it start? Does it bubble up in the rural areas or the urban areas? What does it look like? And this book, look at that. Look at all those page flags. This is how interesting it was and how many details. I was like, oh my God, look at that. Oh my God, think about that. So it may sound dry and boring and the cover sure as heck looks dry and boring. But I found this really fascinating when we're talking about movements of resistance and communities coming together and trying to build momentum. So like right now, when we're trying to talk about um, people going on strike, when we're trying, trying to talk about voter rights, like being pressed down on and struck down and people needing to fight back, like how do you get people together? Yeah, social media, yeah, signing petitions, but like old school, old school, how did they do it? That's really interesting to me. So The Populist Moment by Lawrence Goodwin early booktube favorite um let's see three four five six seven eight nine all right overlay overlay here we come the warmth of other suns hopefully you've heard about this one before and this won't be a surprise recommendation for anyone for historathon and nonfiction november this is by isabel wilkerson who went on to write cast which is a huge bestseller i sort of related to the warmth of other suns more Cast is more, um, ooh, what do I want to say? It has a thesis and a universal conclusion, and then it goes on to prove it with statistics um, and it seems more academic to me, whereas The Warmth of Other Suns has a thesis of like forgotten history, which is the thing in my heart and reveals that through following three different paths that represent um, different decades of people migrating from the south to the north in this period of 1920s to 1940s it's called the great migration and the title i don't think does a great job of explaining what it's describing but the personal stories the hardships the differences depending on where people went and when they went was huge it was fascinating to see um that choice and how that determined how the family fared and you know what their descendants are doing now so lots of great interviews lots of personal sharings and details and that's the like human interest stuff um that i really appreciated in the warmth of other sons book nine Okay, I get to take a rest again and check in with the chat. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, 
Um, bum, 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 bum. Let's see. So Susan Montgomery, uh, mine's about her memoir, Creativity, How It Helped Me Cope and Heal with Colorectal Disease. It's an uplifting story. Alpha Reader helped with feedback. That's awesome. Okay. So creativity and um, disease. So I don't know if it's a chronic illness or it's something that like you're in remission, but we definitely have authors who have similar experiences coping with um, chronic illness and like uh, coming back from cancers and stuff like that. So that's fantastic. And I can't wait to hear more about the memoir and your progress. I forgot to take this down. Oops. There we go. Um, uh, Eva says the 1890 census was lost to fire. I'm not sure what that relates to the library book. Maggie says, still haven't gotten the notification for this or Andy's stream. And I marked them both for notifications this morning. Oh, just a random tidbit. All right. Uh, Eva says, I rarely check notifications, but it shows on the list with a time stamp. Ah, okay. I came in late enough. Things were showing on my subscriptions list. I sit down and pick a live. I rarely pick a live and make sure I'm sat down. <laughs> gotcha. It really is a boring cover. I know. The 70s. What are you going to do? Andy, who's running sprints, swinging by to say hi. Hello. Thank you for telling people about this, Andy. A couple have come by to say hello from your stream. Uh, much more interesting cover. Yes. Um, the warmth of other suns. Yeah. Barrett says, moving to the car to run some errands with chunkers. That's his dog. Will be lurking. Love that cover. Should be a crime, really. A populous moment. Oh, uh, yes. Chronic illness, says Susan. Designed my cover. Super excited about it. Oh, okay. So I don't know if you plan to do a cover reveal, if you're an indie author, if you're working that out with a publisher. I scheduled the cover reveal for tomorrow, and I have a graphic for it. But um, I also wanted to start pre-orders on the same day that I do the cover reveal. So it may take another day. I'm working on the formatting as anyone who is on Twitter and following me um, will know the last couple of days, uh, just hours, just so many versions, so many versions of this file. It's all right. We'll make it. We'll make it there sooner or later. Eva says, yes, there are two authors who share about their Crohn's disease. Barrett Laurie is one. If you haven't seen his content before, he's in the chat. He's in the car. But yes, um, and he might have just delisted the Crohn's videos because they're so long ago and he's like forging forward to a brave new writer's world of tomorrow, but can definitely direct you to some of that content. Susan says, indie author here. This will be my book 12 overall. Oh my goodness. Welcome. Welcome. Glad to meet you. I can't wait to figure out what other books you've read if this is like your memoir. That's very exciting. Morgan Lee is the other talking about Crohn's disease. Excellent. Uh, check them both out. Perfect. Eva says, I introduced them a while ago over their diagnosis. They're both public about it. Were you the link? That's so cool. I don't think I know that. Give herself grace, Margaret, formatting hell. Yeah, I know every time. And I think, oh, it won't be that long this time. Yeah, I dabble in all genres. Well, good. That is the community vibe here. So nice. Good to see it. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. So we're on, we're on 10 now, right? Okay. So nonfiction November and Historathon. Still on the US centric. I told you it would be a long list. This is 20 Years at Hull House by Jane Adams. I have sort of a Yankee version, um, a mass market paperback version that should, by all rights, be falling apart. And again, see all the page flags. Nerd glasses on. Um, I have tried to track down paper versions of her sequel to this 20 more years at Hull House. But several people I have asked about it said it really wasn't worth reading because it's not as good as this. This is her really like major work that broke barriers about, first of all, the field of sociology, what people were starting to do at around 1900, 1890s. And this is a woman who's doing the that exact thing, collecting facts about people, drawing conclusions, and trying to address their needs by looking at the facts. Amazing. I know. So she does it through a charitable institution, but really that's just how she started out sort of with labels. And she really evolves into this mindset of 
people can do things on their own. We just need to give them space and have them like connect to each other and be a sort of congregating place. Um, and I really like her attitude. So there's this, and like I've also dabbled in social thought of Jane Addams by Christopher Lash, which is super interesting. But that's not on my list because I figure <laughs> there's some things that are just too nerdy for people. So we'll stick with 20 years at Hull House. Um, it talks about right after the World's Fair and into like 1903, maybe. Um, so sort of turn of the century. Um, a lot about the ethnic immigrant communities living in Chicago at that time. <clears throat> a little bit about socialism that was um, evolving in that region at that time. And also what came out of this work were maps and papers that are really valuable for people doing, I don't know, historical fiction. Um, and showed like which uh, ethnic group lived in which house block by block in a certain region, like a small section of Chicago. And so like that would be really cool to own, but that one's really expensive because it's a big picture book. So I'll stick with my mass market ganky copy and recommend you find this in any version. I'm sure it's available online too. Um, but yeah, so lots of like turn of the century historical research being done. Historathon October, November, December is 1820 to the present. I will get a few more earlier ones going on, but like um, that definitely qualifies right in the middle. So there you go. Uh, okay, so 20 years at Hill House, oh, overlay. The next one, 11, is an overlay, which is this one. So again, a an early booktube read, which like I can barely remember at this point, but I remember it like blowing my mind. I remember specifically walking across the Broadway bridge, which is this red metal bridge and listening to this on Libro.fm and being like, why don't they tell history like this in schools? This is so interesting. It was kind of like true crime. I mean, the one, the one, one I remember is about the salesman who is running a con, which is perfect for the fraud prompt. Um, but it's basically taking isolated examples of forgotten historical things that aren't really that important when looked at in isolation and connecting the dots to like the waves of um, dynamic movements we have. And this is, I'm sorry, I haven't said the title yet for vision impaired folks. Beautiful Country Burn Again by Ben Fountain. Ben Fountain has just come out with a new book, but this is like, I don't know, five years ago. And like I said, dynamic movements in American history and basically going, huh, kind of like the earthquake folks that are like, we're, we're due a big earthquake in the Pacific Northwest pretty soon, but it could be this year. It could be in 20 years. Who knows? Um, he's basically predicting like there's going to be some big shift in the tides, you know, like in the 1960s, there was one in the 1920s, like the crash and like the socialism the new deal like all that happened and so we've got these sort of like markers of waves of things happening politically in the u.s and he connects the dots of like how that spread how it influenced things and like why we're seeing things that may indicate it's going to happen again of course this was like 2020 so or 2019 maybe so like i think we're in it now it's kind of like the climate crisis there's no more you don't need to predict anything like we're it's happening we're in the middle of it so you know good prediction um no more bets taken right but i thought it was really interesting to again hear about the things that predicted that in former waves of change um and maybe like stuff like that will work again if we're trying to build community around the current change and make the world better in the current model so yeah i really liked that one and would recommend it um then we've got 12 okay this is the one that i have never i don't think talked about on um booktube where is it did i not get a, a one of this either oh okay so i don't have a visual for this one but my last u.s centric nonfiction historathon recommendation is 
how have you not read this? The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by gosh, Skloot, Rebecca Skloot. Um, because she has a relative named Skloot who's in the Pacific Northwest, who's a friend of a friend. Uh, so The Immortal Life. No, it's not about vampires. It's about cells. And it is a journalist who sort of went into this scientific achievement um, that happened at Johns Hopkins in the 40s, I believe, that was actually a violation of a particular person's sovereignty um, named Henrietta Lacks. And what happened was they used her cancer cells when they were diagnosing and um, whatever it's called when you try to dispense healthcare. Uh, when she came into the hospital to reproduce them and then use them to experiment on for scientific experiments for medicines, et cetera, and how to treat cancer. So they didn't know how to do that before. They used her cells without her permission. And now basically like all the cells are HeLa cells, H-E-L-A, based on Henrietta Lacks' original cancer cells that multiply themselves. And so that is sort of the, the middle event, but then you go into why Henrietta Lacks um, ended up at that ER at that date, um, the situation of Baltimore in the 1930s and 40s, and like the power divide, the class divide, the poverty, the racism, um, what happened afterwards, how they developed that scientific uh, discovery into a whole field of medicine, and how like this person um, never got justice, never got like informed about this, never gave consent, and sort of what troubling issues this leads to us leads us to today. Um, so again, I read this over ten years ago. I read it with a book club group in Washington D.C., and I had gone to um, Johns Hopkins for grad school. So it was one of those things like, oh. I've never been to their campus, but that's where this happened. And like, there's the whole town and gown kind of debate debate about the college kids being super rich and privileged and the people around those neighborhoods being poor and disadvantaged. And like, why do they coexist so well together throughout history? And sort of interrogating that trend um, in the context of the scientific medical community and all that. So. Super interesting, classic, like I think everyone's probably read it, but I read it too long ago to be able to talk about it on BookTube. So if you haven't read it, definitely go back and try it out. So that's number 12. I'm going to check back in. Whew. Uh, hello, chat. Let's see. Um... <laughs> yeah, Eva says I take credit. I don't know if I deserve it. Barrett says that's true. Eva, she used the link. That's so wonderful. That's nice when you can like pin it to a certain moment in time. I often like forget how I meet people. Eva's answer to the question of the day, I don't really plan. I pick up a book and either read it or DNF it. DNF tends to be a thing that happens, not a thing that's planned. Well, you can't really plan a DNF, right? I mean, you obviously started the book with the, the hope that you finished, that it'd be interesting enough. So yeah, that makes sense to me. Didn't see the question until you answered it. <laughs> well, that's what we do. We help each other. Eva says, right now I'm reading a middle grade called Katerina's Wish. I don't have it near me to see the author. That sounds familiar. I think I might have seen that cover for that um, cross my desk, as one says. Katerina is one of the children of a family who immigrated. Now her father works the mines and they have a company store. But there's a fish with wishes? Or is there? That's the story. Ooh. Does it talk about the company store ripping people off by like charging inflated prices and withholding their paycheck to um, give them food. Cause that's what I think of when I think company store. Susan says, Barrett, can't wait to watch some of your videos. I have one book out of my poems and illustrations about my ulcerative colitis and surgery to take out McCullen. Quite humorous. Oh my goodness. Well, very cool. Uh, I hope you talk about that on your channel on YouTube, Susan. That'd be really fun to check in on. There is a company store. They don't have it. I like it so far. They don't have it. Uh, missed. I missed an antecedent there. So Shannon's answer is, I don't plan what I read either. I know it will most likely be epic fantasy romance, but I just read through 11 of 
more than 20 books of sci-fi romance and a contemporary horror that I thought was dark romance, but I liked it. Mostly just a mood reader with some recommendations if it sounds interesting. Like the horror that she mentioned, which is Satan's Affair. Nice. Eva says, World History, a true crime podcast. Fits. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, oh, Margaret, I've not read so many. How is easy? I've been meaning to read that forever. Oh, Henrietta Lacks, I bet. Yeah, very cool. All right, Jim says, nearly midnight. I should turn in. Get that sleep, Jim. Monday's a busy day. Happy reading. Sleep well. Have a good night. Uh, Katrina is the name of a girl from the story within the story. The MC is not in Katrina. Oh, okay. Talks about poverty a lot. Okay. <laughs> Oh, oh my goodness. Susan says my channel is mostly ukulele focused at the moment. Ukulele music books out. Four of them with playing examples on YouTube. Okay. Well, yes, we all have multiple facets of personality that can be hard to coordinate on YouTube and read alouds of my uke themed children's books. That's so cool. <laughs> all right. That's so cool. Okay. So we're at 12 and now think we're like past halfway which is good um we've got the uk centric i'm sure emma is no longer here but i've got four books for uk centric historathon and nonfiction. the first is one that i read for our last may of the moderns back in may george orwell's the road to wigan pier so this is basically george orwell's nonfiction that he was commissioned to do where he went to a northern British city and reported on the conditions there, much like you hear about my other books, like research stuff. But then the second one, he waxed lyrical about poverty and the grind and why we're trapped in these situations and sort of power dynamic stuff, which mwah, chef's kiss, George Orwell, favorite. So definitely recommend that. Uh, should be generally available at a library or online, The Road to Wigan Pier. You can see my May of the Moderns wrap up if you want to check out my actual review. That was pretty recent. See, it feels recent. Um, then we've got The Soap Man uh, by Roger Hutchinson, Lewis Harris, and Lord Leverhulme. So if you remember Lever 2000, The Soap, that is based on a multinational corporation called Unilever. Um, it started with this guy and he was, a, you know, merchant's son who made it big during the late industrial revolution. But the part that I read about in this book, The Soap Man, was about his trying to buy an island and like fix it up for the people who live there. And the umbrage the people who lived there took with that decision and how it didn't work out well for him. So we get a little bit about his background, about how he accrued so much money and like made this big business empire. But then we also get the fallout with the islanders in the Scottish islands, uh, Lewis and Harris, and like how they were like, dude, no. <laughs> so I liked I liked that a lot. And um, it was good background. Uh, I didn't end up writing about Lewis and Harris yet. Haven't yet. But who knows? Who knows in the future? This is one of those delicious books that I got while traveling, a Berlin edition, which are hard to find unless you go to museums and trawl the gift shop. Just saying. Just saying. That is that is what I do. And oh my goodness. Third UK centric. This is a Persephone. If anyone knows the telltale signs, a gray book with no cover. Doesn't mean it's not interesting. We've got um, end pages. Persephone book always comes with a bookmark and matching end pages. So there we go. This one is Few Eggs and No Oranges by Vera Hodgson. It is a diary of her time in London during World War II. I also read this for May of the Moderns, but not this year, last year. It was, it was quite the chunker. Um, very interesting. She has the stiff upper lip of a British person going through the Blitz. She also talks about family and how people went in and out of the city, how they tried to procure supplies, how they basically changed their day-to-day -day lives to cope. Um, and it's interesting because I, what I'm reading right now is actually a fiction about the Channel Islands during World War II. Um, so yeah, I'm getting a different viewpoint from this one, but very interesting sustained me through lots of like routine diary entries 
not because it feels like fiction because but because it felt like i won't say relatable because i've never been through something like this but it just made it feel real um so if you're looking for a first person account of world war ii living through the blitz living through the rationing um all that stuff like beer hodgson i really liked her her diary and that is available from persephone a beautiful publisher based in fall off so there we go that's my stack is too big now third uk centric and the last the fourth one i have is our tempestuous day a history of regency england by carolee erickson this was also pre-booktube, so I don't have a review of this up, but it has sat on my shelf as a resource book, even though I haven't read a region or written a Regency set book. Um, but it was very entertaining. It's got kind of like uh, what Dickens ate and Bronte wore, whatever that book is about, basically all the little everyday details that you want as a fiction author writing historical fiction. Um, but also a little bit more into the in-depth stuff. So, you know, if you're writing Regency, <clears throat> Emma Bennett, um, and wanted a little bit more background to make it juicier, which I don't think is her thing because she's more about like sweet romance and that is the focus. But, you know, if you're ever interested, our Tempestuous Day did a great job of um, explaining the movements. I would say it's still very complicated. The system in the UK... Um, coming from the Georgian era into the Regency and launching into like industrial revolution stuff is really, really fascinating to me. So um, there is a lot going on and this just takes a couple bites at it, but it does give you a new look at Jane Austen books, I will say. So if that's your thing, I definitely recommend that for nonfiction or historathon. There's the UK books. Okay, last rest, dive into the chat. I'll take the uh, banner down here so we can finish up. We won't finish at the hour. That's okay. I'll have to go a little over. Uh, excuse me, the sniffling. Um, Eva says, maybe hop into an author tube karaoke and play some. You, <gasps> that would be that would be great. <clears throat> Susan, if you don't know, last night we had our monthly second Saturday of the month. Uh, author tubers host karaoke. It switches between my channel and Barrett Laurie's channel, and we go back and forth. So, we encourage people to come up and sing with us live on the channel. And while accompaniment may be a bit of a challenge, I would love to try it. The timing, the lag sometimes interferes, but like that would be really fun to try if you're game. Yes, thank you for the suggestion, Eva. That's perfect. Uh, that's awesome. You have a YouTube channel that supports your books or vice versa, which many of us fall into creating content for other writers, be you readers. My voice is going. <clears throat> so we'll just pop these up for folks to read from the chat. Eva and Susan having a little chat here. Children's books. Yep. Smart. Uh, Victoria says, I'm not even kidding. I just thought yesterday that I should take ukulele lessons. I had a music class in elementary school and got one, but I haven't played it since. Honey child, elementary school and you still have a ukulele. <laughs> wow. Victoria, you're at my level of like, I won't say hoarding. I'll say hanging on to precious things. How about that? Yeah. She says so much fun. Great YouTube teachers too. Nice. It just says, I need to understand how to read as quickly as you read, Margaret. These are like over years. These are a lot of books. This isn't a wrap up. This is a recommendation video. So don't, don't even stress. A lot of the middle grade, middle grade I read is historical, says Eva. If you ever do a middle grade month, I may actually know some of the titles. Yeah, I don't read very much middle grade. Occasionally, um, one will leap out at me, but like maybe two a year. So, yeah, that's not really my specialty. Eva picks by the spine, veto by the cover while at the library. Yeah. The people with the kiddos. Different, different animal. <laughs> Eva saw karaoke after it ended. Oh, well. Spoken word poetry with my ukulele. Nice. I did a poem. I did a poem last night. Not when I wrote, but when I thought was seasonally relevant. It was fun. 
So Shannon getting us some links. Victoria, I got it from my brother for my birthday. Ah, can't exactly get rid of it. It's hanging on to precious things. That definitely fits the bill. <laughs> yes, figure I should use it. That sounds like a fine idea. I love it. I love it. All right, last gasp. So we've covered nonfiction November and historathon that overlaps because all I all I want to read is history. Um, for fraud, capital, they had labor and capital, that was perfect, right? Um, and display, display. Oh, display will go into with the science books as well as web. So here we go. The last few are going to be my. Um, oh my science and nature recommendations, which I have some. If you don't want to read all history and politics or none of those, press your buttons. Never fear. I've got some science and nature ones. So the first one, let's see, I've got an overlay for. <clears throat> there we go. I've recommended it before, and I think this is like a sleeper hit. I was really interested in Clutter, an Untidy History by Jennifer Howard. Because it's one of those eclectic books, y'all. It goes into um, personal recollections. It goes into the history of clutter, which obviously has to touch on the Victorians. You know, my Victorians loved some clutter. It goes into um, the word for the, not mizzen head, that's a mast. The word for the rubbish heap in history when you find a pile of trash from the Vikings. It's called something with an M. Anyway, excavating like like little hordes of glass bottles to see where they came from. Victorians. Oh, I loved it. It goes from that into like mass production of things and the paradox of choice and why we have so much disposable stuff. And like with our aging population, we have people who are going through clutter that they don't, that they can't deal with when their parents die. And there's companies that are involved, evolved to take care of this. And like, it's an industry. It's just like this whole examination of material culture, um, a little bit on a personal level, but mostly on a societal level and mostly American focused. But I found it really fascinating and, um, she also uh, sent me the link for resources where she'd pulled some of her information. So she was really nice. I met her on Twitter. And so therefore, like, personal connection makes it even better. So clutter and untidy history. That's one. Sociology, I guess, not really nature or science. Then I've got um, this one, which I'm not sure why I bought it. Uh, I think... I think it was a pressure situation in a bookstore where I knew people, but it's new. It's a very nice quality book. Um, and it's climate focused. So all we can save truth, courage, and solutions for the climate crisis edited by Ayana Elizabeth Johnson and Catherine K. Wilkinson. So it's a bunch of short pieces and that is all the top turned down no bottom turned down. If you know my channel, you know what that means. A lot of it is science focused. Some of it is environmental policy focused. And some of it is actually poetry and community building focused. So it's this beautiful state of the state of the climate crisis and how people are dealing with it. Um, and the title is pretty evocative. So I loved how this was organized and the pieces that were chosen so much that I found another science book, The Best American Science and Nature Writing of 2022, which was edited by the same, oops, edited, there we go, edited by the same person, Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. So that's my third science and nature sort of other recommendation. Um, and this actually takes in lots of animals that I didn't know about uh, and sort of like weird things around the world and um, science that is being done, observations and uh, experiments and people that I've never heard of. Um, so like display would be in there because there's animals that are being observed. So they're displaying how they react to humans. 
Um, and then also they're displaying their findings to the scientific community. So that fits, right? That fits the challenge. Uh, yeah, again, one, like, if I wasn't so impressed by Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, I wouldn't have picked this up and, you know, paid for full price, like, paperback about science and nature writing. This isn't my usual purchase. But I was so impressed. I, I'm trying to find what else she's written, and that was the only other thing I could find. So definitely recommend. Then we've got two more, and then we're done. Um, this is the latest read. This is just last week's read, The Living Mountain by Nan Shepard. So you'll be familiar if you've been here recently. Uh, another, I think the same bookstore, Pressure Cell, hardback, new, um, Science and Nature. It's about woman, one woman's relationship with the mountains she grew up around and basically how she perceives that ecosystem and how it exists in the world and affects her life. Um, written in the 1940s and classic of like nature memoirs slash mountaineering because the Karen Gorms are the mountains being discussed. Really great. You can refer back to my last Wednesday wrap up if you're more curious to get that review. And then Final Science in Nature is a England set uh, nonfiction called Orchard, A Year in England's Eden by Ben McDonald and Nick Gates. Um, that is a writer and a photographer generally, but I think they collaborated more um, comprehensively with this book. They examine or observed a piece of land that has sort of stayed in the state of, um, I think, early 18th century orchard plantings and not been subject to development around it. And so it's become a haven for um, insects, birds, wildlife, migrating species, all those sorts of things. So they observe it around the year and talk about the different, um, I don't know, mating rituals is not what I want to say, but that sort of thing. And like how, how the ecosystem works, how different species provide different ecosystem services to each other, if that doesn't sound too much like an economist. So yeah, Orchard. Um, I've reviewed this several times, recommended it several times for different readathons. So uh, if you're curious about more or like reading from this book, especially when I was trying to like get Beth Ann interested, um, that is elsewhere on the channel. So you could just go and, and search Orchard to find it. Whew, oh my goodness. Five minutes after the hour. I almost made it. The last one I want to bring to your attention is my current read. So um, I am currently listening to Black Ghost of Empire by Chris Manjapra on Libro.fm. came out a while ago. It's a 2022 book, but it's tying together not the socialist movements, but a lot of the sort of racial history in the United States reading that I've been doing. I am engaging with this a lot, which is hard because I'm listening to it and I listen to audiobooks when I walk. So I'm having to stop and like take notes on my phone. Um, and yeah, that's not the greatest for exercise, <laughs> but the book is so interesting. Uh, currently, I think I'm still in the first section, even though I'm halfway through, which talks about North and South America and uh, empires. Specifically, we've gone from British Empire and America breaking away to the French Empire and Haiti breaking away. And like, again, um, kind of like the color of law, but for further back in history, you see how slavery was basically perpetuated, um, but in a gaslighting sort of way. So we talk about Haiti's independence and how that happened like after 14 years of war, 1804, a bunch of different leaders sort of succeeded on, but they were isolated by the international community. Their independence wasn't recognized. And then um, in order to participate in the international community, I don't know how beneficial that was. Um, there were terms put on kind of like the reparations for Germany in World War I that were crippling debts that they then owed to France for the rest of their like statehood lives. And I don't know, maybe that has something to do with the fact that Haiti's always been a developing nation behind everyone else because it's always been servicing its debts before it actually makes lives better for its people because of this international regime. Um, and I didn't know about the history of this, about the leaders and the revolts and the empires that were waiting offshore to try to attack and the French that tried to re-enslave the, the citizens that threw them off during Napoleon. Like, oh my gosh, it's so, so exciting. 
Oh God, I'm losing my voice. Okay, this is going to be good for the rest of the day. So yeah, only halfway through this book, but I really want to talk to someone else about this because like all this is mystery from my history education. Um, it's called The Long Death of Slavery and the Failure of Emancipation. I know writers want to think that words have a lot of power um, and they do. They may be overstating the case to say that using emancipation instead of liberation was like the root of the problem of abolition. If you know, you know. Um, but yeah, I'd really like to talk to someone about this. So I'm recommending it for November so that I can talk to some of you on BookTube about it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. That is, that is my hour of power. <laughs> Thank you for joining. I will put, um, tags in or like time stamps in afterwards so people can access things because that was a lot. I'll divide it up so people can find the books. Um, but yeah, I'm just so excited about November, nonfiction November, Historathon, and coming on Wednesday, I'll be giving recommendations for Indigathon or Native November or Skoden or whoever decides to lead a readathon for that who has the street cred, not me. Um, but I do have Teen Hunt. We've got a Patreon book club. I need to start the night circus, but I can't do that for another few days because I'm formatting a box set. It's going to be going out quite soon. So if you're interested in the Night Circus for October, check out the link in the banner. And um, yeah, I, I think I should wrap up because my voice is really going. <clears throat> cool gamer. Hello, hello. Nice to see you. Rachel says, so much fun. I wrote down a couple of those titles. Stories from the life and loves of a dragon take place in the 1830s to 1850s. So I have to be careful how I describe things. Yeah, 1830s. So it's Victorian slash, um, yeah, there's a lot going on in the U.S. here too. So, yeah. Susan says, clutter sounds interesting. Yes, definitely check it out from your library if you can. Uh, it does sound interesting. I love when things go that far into the research. You find out things you never realized, right? Rabbit holes. We're all about the rabbit holes here. <laughs> Cool cover. I don't know which one you're talking about. Um, I had a lot of good covers for the science and nature ones. Nice topography on the orchard cover. Yes, very English. Yeah, this is why I need to go travel again. Um, you've inspired me to read more. Yay, the mountain book cover. I know that was definitely a cover buy. I couldn't resist. Just it was time. It's been on. It'd been on my wish list. It was time. So yes. So hopefully for whoever watches this, like at least something in that bucket of, I don't know, 18, 19 books will appeal for November and you can report back and let me know if you enjoyed or not. I like to hear either way because, you know, um, sometimes I read a book and I go, oh, this has some problems with it. And sometimes I don't see it until someone points it out to me. So definitely love to learn and talk about books. That's what the channel is for. So thank you for watching, for joining for any portion of this, and I hope you're doing well, and I will see you again soon, maybe Wednesday for the wrap-up slash Indigathon recommendations. Until then, take care, and yeah, that's it. Enjoy the rest of the weekend, everybody. Bye! <laughs>